How's everything going? Super, that's great. Where'd everybody go? Oh, it's just 12. It'll take a few minutes. Um, so how many people have finished lab seven? Close. Close? Just about, okay, cool. I'm not going to be a super stickler on the, the submission deadline for lab seven, but we want to move on to lab eight, right? So lab eight is extra credit, right? Lab eight is extra credit, extra fun. Um, lots of bragging rights. <laughs> any, any particular issues with lab seven that we can talk about? Have you, presumably you've gotten to the point where you can do something that tr tries to compile your Verilog code, even if your code's not compiling correctly. Right, you've gotten to where you can run the software and you know how to put in slash iVerilog, slash bin, slash iVerilog, and all of that. Right, no questions on that aspect. So, um, so any questions on Verilog itself? Yeah. Well, just on the lab report, Noel. So, like, uh, is it okay if we just have like mainly pictures, a little bit of description, or do you want us to go in detail and describe everything? Because it's kind of like if we have the pictures, uh, do you want us to explain each little thing? You don't have to, so you can assume the reader knows how to read a timing diagram or knows how to read your output, right? Definitely, definitely include your code, okay? And I suggest don't just take a screenshot of your code, right? Copy and paste your code into your lab document, right? So that it's easily readable, because screenshots are usually pretty hard to read. So just copy the code from Notepad or whatever and paste it into your doc file. Um, Try to make the screenshots legible, right? Make them take up the whole width. It makes it easier to see what's going on. But if there's anything peculiar going on or anything peculiar that you know you ran into in implementing it and such, definitely talk about that. Um, if it seems pretty straightforward, then the code and the, the screenshots are probably sufficient. But put in you know a few sentences. Here's the code for experiment one. Tell me what it does, right? This as an end of two inputs. Here's a screenshot of the timing diagram. Here's the output. That's fine. Is there like a reference I can use that has like how you construct your uh, assignments of the gates like on the multiplexer? Mm -hmm. I, it wasn't very intuitive for me to know like what the problem would be for the gates. Okay. You mean what it's supposed to do, or um, what the syntax might be? Let me look at uh, come back to it. OK. Yeah. I mean, I think I might have a similar question. I'm not sure. When um, on the multiplexer, when we're making our assignment uh, to what x is, mm -hmm. um, I can't decide to like the select, the select inputs. I can't decide if to use the equal equal symbol or equal or the the triangle equals which one do we So use? so equal equal tells you if two things are the same. Right. So that's comparison. Right? This is this is copy from the input to the output. This is is load in into a flip flop. Right here, we're really thinking of where out is probably a register, and this is going to go inside an always block. Oh, so you, once you have a um, the bracket, well, how, what would you call this symbol right there? The this thing? Yeah. Uh, I'd call it less than equal. Or when you it's have technically, it's a non-blocking assignment. That's what it's called. When we have that symbol, do we need to always have it always? You're always going to want that inside and always block because you're really trying to load into a flip-flop, okay. right? And the only time that you can load into a flip-flop is when the clock ticks. So we put this inside and always block. It says at the positive edge of the clock or negative edge of some signal. So... The ternary operator has the 
the following syntax. Assign out equals parentheses some condition, question mark, and then some statement, colon some other statement, right? If the condition is true, then this gets copied to out. If the condition is false, then this gets copied to out. And that kind of statement makes it pretty straightforward to do the multiplexer. Um, can you do that for like three different, um, what is it? Like a pair of conditions? Yeah. So you can do the following. So break that down, what's it going to do? If condition 1 is true, this is going to set out equal to value 1. If condition 1 is false, then it's going to set out equal to the result of this expression, which depends on condition 2, right? So condition 2, true, it's going to be val 2. Condition two, false, val three. So you can start putting together compound versions of this like that. You got your question? Um, you kind of like answered it. It was okay. just about how you wrote your assign yeah, so that general form. Yeah. And this can be pretty much anything on either side of this colon. It evaluates that expression and it copies it to the thing on the left of the equal sign. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you kind of explain the difference between register and wire? Mm -hmm. Sure. Like when to use them, that was kind of what something I was writing. Basically, if there's a value that you want to remember, you're going to want to use a register. And when we make test benches, we're using registers because we're saying at 10 nanoseconds, put a 1 into this variable. Okay. And we want that value to persist, right? So a register is the only thing that makes sense. But inside a, a genuine Verilog module, basically, if you're in an always block, and you're trying to assign something in re response to, say, a clock edge, right? You probably want a register. Okay. If you're using an assign something equals something, you probably want a wire. So is, is that kind of always? I kind of noticed on too. It seemed like majority inputs were wires and outputs were registers. Yeah, no, typically, <laughs> because the inputs. We don't want to remember those, right? They're being driven by something outside, such as a test bench or maybe another piece of circuitry that's, that's instantiating this. So yeah, the inputs will generally be wires. The outputs, if we're making an AND gate, the output would be a wire, right? Because it's going to be connected to the output of some piece of logic. That's where it's going to get its value from. But if it's a counter or a state machine or something stateful that has memory, then it's probably going to be a register. Yeah, that's a good observation. If you have a clock, it's probably going to be used as a trigger for an always statement. It doesn't have to, but it's not, it's probably not really a clock unless you're using it that way, right? But there's nothing in the language that will force you to do that. Some of the other tools will, 
they'll say you've got something called a clock and it doesn't look like a clock. Um, and if you have multiple modules, right, that have clock as one of the inputs, typically you're going to have a test bed that generates the clock, right, and that gets connected to the clock on all these different modules. This idea of having one clock that just gets fed into everywhere that we want a clock that carries over. So state machine questions? So Z is a melee output, right? It depends on the state and the input. So if you're in state H, um, Z is going to be either a 1 or a 0, depending on what your input is. Um, if you're in state VH, Z is always equal to 1. So um, there's a few options. You could do it as a big, long something like this ternary operator, right? But we could also make the output z a register. And in your block of if statements where you're deciding what the new state is, right? So let's see. Um, so if you're in state h, let me just mimic this. something like so you got you got to come up with a way to number your states let's suppose this is 2 and this is 1 and this is 3 right so if state equals 2 and x equals 0 So you're in this state and your input is a zero, right? So state, new state is three, and z is a zero. Otherwise, if you're in state 2 and your input's a 1, set your state to 1 and set z to 1. state would be probably a two-bit register, right, because we want four possible values for it. Um, well, if it's a four-bit register, you got to go 0, 1, 2, 3, because you can't store a 4 in a four-bit, right? Um, so a two-bit register, value 0 through 3, and Z would just be a register that's a single bit. X can be a wire because it's an input. Um, clock is an input, and I think that's all you need. Maybe you want to reset input, which could be a wire that just throws you into state zero or something, some initial state. And you got to be careful inside these always blocks or inside the whole module to make sure you don't have conflicting statements because it's easy to write something that looks like you're trying to give something two values at once. And even if you know that will never happen, the compiler may not know it and it will complain about it. All right, 
let's break into groups and let's go to the board. Let's do four or five groups and we're going to write some Verilog as a group. Oh, no. I'm going to pause this. <laughs> shoots an infrared laser beam charged like a battery like built into a table and then it can like keep the power and you can charge there wirelessly. Do we have 270? It like banks the power. So I mean like wall in front of the 270 table. is usually in 126. Yeah. I don't know why it's still warm in here. It's terrible. It's getting to be summer, it's warm outside, so. And it's not, it's, it's actually cool outside. Is it really cold outside? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, it's like feels awesome outside. Yeah. Just open a window like or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, you, uh, you what? They need to get like a AC unit, like a little air conditioner. Well, we can do that. The central AC is not working. Yeah, we could go rogue and just like build in our own. We could do class outside, except I need the projector right now. Um, but we can do some 270 outside, maybe. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That'd be so cool. We can do that. We got an outdoor classroom right outside really? the front of the building. Really? We do have to build a lot for 270, because it's a 70. That would be so fun. <laughs> 270, so how many people here are, are signing up for my 270 in the summer? Oh, I don't know if it's yours. It's <laughs> the same size. It's like taking 270. You should have asked why I'm asking before you, you outed yourself. Um, so my my intention, time permitting, is to flip the 270 class. So a flipped class, the idea is I'm going to do a five to ten minute video ahead of time and post it online. And you're going to want to watch that video and maybe do some reading in the book outside of class. Okay, and then when we come into class, we're basically just going to do problems. So it's flipping it around, right? You do the lecture at home, and you do the homework and lecture. Um, yeah. So if we missed a homework class, it would hurt us or not really? Um, particularly in summer, that's an eighth of the course, <laughs> minus, <laughs> minus exams, right? So um, that can be pretty significant. But it, it, can be, it can be dealt with. We can talk about it. Um, but yeah, so, so that's the intent, is, is we're going to mostly, um, once we get rolling after the first one or two uh, meetings, We'll mostly be working on problems during class time for half the class, and then the other half of the class is the open lab where you'll be working on your lab assignment. Yeah? So is that the only time we can be working on our lab assignment? Yes, so summer is not an open lab schedule, right? There's, there's time for each class that's allocated to working in the lab as well. Um, say again? You will be building some things on the proto boards, but the circuits are not as complex. And we're going to do most of the labs on these little, um, they call them the EdBots. They're these little computer controlled cars that you can drive around. And you're mostly going to be writing programs for those and using that as your development platform. So it's much more a software endeavor than wiring up circuits. And we're not doing any K-maps or truth tables or things like that. We might do some truth tables, but, but we're not doing the kind of, of digital analysis that we've been doing in here. Uh -huh. So how do we know that we're going to get enough time for the labs? Because some of them take a long time to do. <coughs> yes, they do. Um, they're only restricted to a couple of hours every day. Yeah, it's challenging. But typically, it's going to be you know four hours, maybe six of lab time. There's only five labs in 270. Yeah. So we get a week and a half, roughly, per lab. So that's six hours of lab time. Are there any lab assistants during that? Time? So I will be in there for the whole lab time. Oh. Right? Oh, so you have right. complete access to me, and you're not competing with other people for you know access oh. to the, the laptops and so on, the PCs. So it's, it's dedicated time for this particular section of the class. If you need, need, need more time, right, you can talk to whoever's teaching the other section and say, hey, can I come in and work if there's space? And that can usually be done. But in general, you can't just kind of like come in whenever and work on the lab. So, and it usually works out because, because we lecture on this and then we go do a lab on this, right? And I'm there to help you out. And so it, it to me, it actually works better than during the regular quarters because you get that nice linkage between the lecture material and the lab material. But flipping it's going to be new, right? So it's, it's going to be um, a bit of an experiment, but 
I believe it's going to work a lot better because the kinds of things we're doing in 270 really, really need you to work through a lot of problems to nail the concepts. The concepts are pretty straightforward, but until you actually do them, they can be kind of mystical. Um, and doing a few specific examples using these concepts usually just nails it down right away. So that's my intent. We'll see how it actually plays out. Um, and we'll talk about it more once, once the course starts. But I think it'll be really good. All right, so, um, so Lab 8, optional Lab 8, we're working with FPGA. So this is an FPGA. It's from a little company called Numato. They make really inexpensive but totally awesome FPGA boards. So here's the board that we're going to be working with. And I'm going to go ahead and pass this around while I, I talk about it. Um, but the big thing in the middle, that's the actual FPGA, right? So that chip right there, that's the programmable device. And that blur of, of silver here, you'll see those are individual pins on this. Um, this is just support hardware to let the laptop talk to this board through a USB port. So let me go ahead and pass that around while I start talking about the lab. So lab eight, the goal is to basically take the Verilog we've been talking about and use it to design some circuits and then actually load the circuits onto that board so that we get a physical implementation of an AND gate or an XOR gate or a counter or something like that. So I'll, I'll run quickly through the lab itself and then I wanna go through the tools that you use to actually turn your Verilog code into a configuration on that and hopefully we'll go through a demo. Um, I haven't tried this ahead of time, so we're doing this without a safety net, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so experiment one is going to be basically making an AND gate. Okay, so, so nothing too surprising there, but there's four push buttons on that board, and there's four LEDs. And we're going to set it up so that if you press two of the buttons, the LED comes on. And if you only press one button, the LED is off. Okay, and we'll probably pick on that as a... Um, a demo we'll go through today, but then your challenge is to actually do it yourself using the tools. Um, experiment two, we're going to introduce a clock and you want to make the LED on the board blink on and off at a certain rate. Um, one of the chips on that board is actually an oscillator. You can see a little uh, metal canister. That's a, probably a piece of quartz crystal and circuitry can tap into the resonant frequency of that and use it to generate a very stable clock. And I believe it runs at 100 megahertz, yes. Um, so there's a signal on board once you power it that's ticking 100 million times a second. And we can tap into that and we can basically feed that into a counter and say, hey, after um, 200 million ticks, let's turn the LED on. And after another 200 million ticks, let's turn it off. Well, that'll make it blink on and off every two seconds. And you just need to count up to 200 million and then toggle the value of the LED. So that's experiment two. Experiment three is the traffic light. This is the, the big one. Um, and we have a test bed available which has um, a little traffic light hanging in the middle and three lanes in the T-intersection. And there's actually sensors underneath the roadway where I've got those magnets sitting. And I've got three cars I upgraded from these. Um, we've got a school bus and a truck and something else. And they have <laughs> magnets inside. And they'll trip the sensor if you put them on the lane um, next to the traffic light. And so the inputs to the light and the, the outputs from the sensors are all available on this proto board. And if you implement your traffic light controller in Verilog and put it on that FPGA board, all you gotta do is connect a bunch of wires from your FPGA board to this test bed. So this is a physical test bed. <laughs> and once you hook this up and you power the board, you can put your cars and school buses on there and the lights will do their thing. So that's, that's sort of the ultimate goal. And then all of this talks about how we can go about doing that. So we'll, we'll talk through the details of this. Um, so that's the FPGA board that's going around. And you can see the switches on the bottom of it. And then there's eight LEDs actually, not four, above it. 
Um, this is the layout of it. So these rectangles on the side labeled 1, 2, 39, 40, those are connection points. You can pop wires in there just like you do on a proto board and you connect to a different port that the FPGA has access to. And when we make a module and we say input A, we can make another file called a constraint file and say input A is connected to pin 39, right? And then on, on jumper one. And then if we put a wire right here, whatever value we put into that, that gets fed into input A. And we can say output B is pin two on jumper two. And if we put an LED right here, it'll turn on if we set that variable equal to one. So very easy to interface this thing. All the hard work is done in software. So that's, that's just the, uh, the interface to the test bed. So your sensors are down here on the bottom, east, south, west, and then you have red, green, and yellow lights for the three lanes. And your circuit is something that reads these three sensors and then drives these nine lights. And this is just a ground connection that we run to have the common ground between the FPGA and the test bed. And I already got resistors in there for you, so you don't have to put in resistors yourself. <laughs> All right, and I did do this myself, right, to make sure that it's doable, and it is doable, and so that's what it looked like when I hooked up my FPGA, and like I say, it's just a bunch of wires. So very straightforward to connect. Um, so that's, that's your experiment three. And my hope is that you'll try this lab, right, and that you'll get through as many of the experiments as you can. If you don't get to the traffic light, right, if you get through the first two, if you get through the first one, you've done pretty much, you know, all the hardest work, right? And then it's, it's a Verilog question after that. So let's, um, let's actually do something with this. So I'm on Linux, I have my own installation of the software tools, but on the Windows machines in the Collaboratorium, if you walk into the Collaboratorium and you go out the door right next to Izad's office and then onto my office, in that back corner that you pass, there's six PCs, three next to the door and three next to the window. Those six PCs have the software pre-installed, okay? And there's an icon you can use, um, Project Navigator, I think it's called, and you can run the software from there. And there's also a couple of things taped onto one of the cabinets in the windowsill with some commands you can use. If running it the normal way doesn't work, try using those commands. Um, but I'm going to run it a different way from here. Which is as follows. So, to work with the Xilinx, the FPGA in the middle of that board is made by a company called Xilinx. And every manufacturer who makes an FPGA, they also make a set of software for working with it. And we're still going to use Verilog, but to convert from the Verilog into the particular ones and zeros to program that device, we have to use Xilinx's software. If we get a chip made by Altera, we have to use Altera's software. So this is, this is what the basic interface looks like, and it's big and crowded and confusing and all this kind of stuff, and that's okay. Um, so let's start from scratch. And let's make, um, let's make an OR gate, because the lab asks for an AND gate. So we'll do an OR. Um, let's do an XOR. You already did the Verilog for an XOR. So, um, so I'm going to put in the name of my project, right? It should be something descriptive. Don't put any spaces anywhere. That's my general advice for all modern software. A lot of stuff still breaks with spaces, and it doesn't necessarily tell you that's what's going on. Um, I set my location once to be home, Nick, file, Xilinx, webpack, right? Pick a location somewhere reasonable. If you're working on a flash drive, point to a directory in your flash drive, and then all your work will get saved automatically. Because again, the machines in the collaboratorium, they forget everything once you log out. So I'm not going to change too many defaults. Really, I'm just setting the name, and the first, first, first time you do this, you want to go ahead and set the location. 
Um, and I'm going to say next. So you do need to change a few things here. Under family, you want to change it to Spartan 6. Okay, and there's all sorts of different devices. You want Spartan 6. And this should all be documented. Um, not in this lab, but there's another handout in uh, Canvas right around lab seven. It's, it's um, using the Mimas board or using the Xilinx software. So that'll document this. So select a Spartan 6, and then under device, you need to select um, XC6 SLX9. That's the model number of the FPGA. Okay, because all these things are slightly different. They have different pins and so on. So Spartan 6, XC6, SLX9. So I can put these on the board. And then you have to specify the package. So TQG144. And that's, I think, a thin. It's quad, so it's got pins on all sides. And it's got a total of 144 pins. So 36 pins per side. And the rest of this you can leave by default. Default speed will be minus 3, I believe. Um, Top level source is going to be an HDL. We can also do this with a uh, schematic entry sometimes. We're going to do HDL. And um, preferred language, make sure that says Verilog instead of VHDL. OK, because we haven't done VHDL. And then we're just going to click through on Next. That's going to give us a summary. You can make sure that everything looks right here. And then say Finish. And now we've got a whole bunch of files in our directory, and we've got this big empty window, and we need to write some Verilog code. So I'm going to right click on my project, and I'm going to say New Source. Okay, so right click New Source, and under Source, I'm going to say Verilog Module. And under File Name, I'm going to pick some name for this particular module. So I'm just going to call it XOR gate. And I'll say next. And now it's giving us a way to basically describe what the system diagram looks like. So we're going to have two inputs, A and B, and one output, X. So under port name, I'm going to say A. That's already listed as an input. And if we wanted it to be a bus, if we wanted more than one bit, we could select bus, and we could put in 2 and 0, for example if we had a three-bit in, three input. So let's just make A an input, B an input, and X is going to be an output. So we'll come down to output. And that's our whole system diagram, right? Two in, one out. So I'm going to get rid of these because I don't know if it'll confuse it. I probably shouldn't have typed those. Um, Okay, that's fine. <laughs> we'll see if it breaks. All right, and so there's a summary of what you did, and you can say finish, and it writes some code for you. All right, so we've got a header in the top. Um, it's made the module statement. It's listed the inputs and the outputs, and they put in the end module statement. We just got to fill in the middle part. Okay, so. So if A is not equal to B, it'll be a 1. Otherwise, it'll be a 0. That was one way that we could write an XOR. The other way was to do not A and B or A and not B. Right? So either one is fine. Um, right, something like that. Um, that's our whole module. So let me indent it so it looks prettier. Um, and this stuff that it puts in the top, right, company and engineer, you could fill that in through various options in the tools, and then it'll remember that every time that you start a new module, it'll fill that in for you, except on the collaboratorium, it would forget when you log out. But, you know, if you're doing this yourself. 
Um, and this is this is very typical of what you'll be doing, say, in industry, if you actually do FPGA type work. With Xilinx, you might actually be using this tool. Although this one's kind of old, there's a newer one called Vivado. But it would look exactly like this, right? I mean, this is this is the free version of the commercial software that people have been using to to do serious things with this. All right, so I'm going to save this with Control S, um, and we can go ahead and click this arrow, and this will start the synthesis step. So it's going to try and basically figure out how to turn this module into hardware. And it's going to do a whole bunch of things. This was a pretty short module, so the synthesis finished pretty quickly. And we can expand these and see exactly what it's doing. So now it's implementing the design. It's doing a translate, was done. It's doing the map phase. And then it's going to do place and route. And place and route's going to be the last step. And expect this to take a couple of minutes, OK? Um, for a really big design, it can take a long time. If you're filling up your device, this can take, you know, a few days of mm -hmm. runtime. After which it may say internal error, contact vendor. <laughs> All right, that's happened to me. <laughs> All right, so uh, it says generate post, uh, post place and route static time and complete it successfully. It's done. Okay. Our green arrow is done. We've got check marks next to here. It had some kind of warning on the synthesis, but I'm not going to worry about that. Um, and if we were to go back and look at this code, look at this output, right? it's telling us all kinds of things. But it's also telling us how much it's utilized different types of resources. So it hasn't used much of these. It used three I.O. buffers. So that's our two input and output. Um, but up here, it's used 1% of the registers and 1% of the lookup tables. The lookup table is a truth table, right? And it's basically configuring truth tables inside these blank pieces of logic and then connecting them together. So those blank pieces are called um, a lookup table, and it's got 5,700 of them, and it's used exactly one, okay? Which is probably configured to be an exclusive or. So at this point, we can come to Tools. We can say Schematic Viewer. We can say, let's look at um, what this thing actually generated. So if we look for RTL, that's called Register Transfer Language, it'll show us kind of a logical view of our XOR gate. So there's our system diagram. And we can double click on it. And it turned it into something like this. It made some block compare A, B, not equal. 0, 1, and there's two inputs and an output. And that's kind of a logical view of what's going on, but it doesn't really tell us a whole lot. Now, if we come to Tools and we say Schematic Viewer and we say Technology, it shows us the same XOR gate, but when we double click on it, it shows us for this particular chip, what did it do? So it took the input A on the bottom, it runs it through a buffer. Buffer is an inverter that doesn't invert. It just copies the input to the output. Why do you want to copy the input to the output? Well, this is handling the fact that the output is going to be a physical pin. It's going to be a lot of current going into that. And inside the system, we don't need a lot of current. We need a little bit of current. But we may need to take that signal and send it multiple places. So it's conditioning the input. And on the output, we have this little tiny current coming out of these few transistors inside this chip. And we've got to get that to deliver 20 milliamps so we can drive an LED or something. So the buffer is conditioning the output. So we have A and B going into this lookup table, and the output goes to our output port. So we can click on the lookup table, and there's a schematic of what it actually implemented. So it made an AND gate. It took one input, inverted it, and ANDed it with the other non-inverted input. And down here, it took the first input, and it with, non, with the inverted second input, it took those two and it ORed them together, and it gave us an output. So it took that ternary operator we had, that assign statement, and it figured out this is what it needs to implement in order to make that happen. And we can look at the equation. So it's using exclamation marks for negation, so not I0 and I1, or I0 and not I1. Why does the schematic have that much going on? 
Uh, I don't think you could do it more easily. Right, because we're, we're really doing Right, that's what the output should be. Oh, uh, I guess so. So you gotta have two inverters, you gotta have two OR gates, and you gotta have two AND gates and one OR gate. So that's what it's got. Sure. So there's the equation. There's the truth table, right? And that's an XOR truth table. And there's the K map. So it does all this 250 stuff, yes. right? to go from your Verilog back to an actual circuit. All right, so it compiled and it did a lot of analysis. It checks timing. There's no real timing issue here because we don't have a clock, but it does a lot of different analysis on your design. And sometimes you'll make a design and it'll say, I can't synthesize this. There's no way to satisfy the timing requirements. Right? Or there's not enough stuff inside the FPGA to actually implement this. So it, it does a lot of, of kind of sanity checking on your design. But in this case, everything worked fine. Okay, so there's one more step down here, generate programming file. That would give us a bit file we can actually load into the FPGA. But there's one thing still missing. We haven't told it where input A, input B, and output X should be on the actual board. Right? They'll be somewhere, but we haven't said where, and we don't know where it's going to put those. So we have to constrain those to particular locations. So in the lab, I actually show you the configuration lines. So these three lines right here, and copying and pasting is really not good in this viewer, but we'll try it. So what does all this mean? It means that I have a net, right, of collection of wires called X, and I want that to be at location P119. IO standard is low voltage CMOS 3.3 volts. So it doesn't do 0 to 5 volts, it does 0 to 3.3, but it's close enough to 0 to 5. We can pretend it's 0 to 5, but we don't actually want to ever put 5 volts into one of these things. In fact, we never want to put any voltage into these. Okay, we do not want to hook up power to it except by connecting the USB port. But you never want to feed 5 volts or anything like that into any of those connectors because these will get burned out really easily. Um, so X is an output. Um, the drive is set to 24, which means it's going to deliver 24 milliamps max. And slew fast just means it'll change quickly. A and B are on P124 and P123. And those have this extra thing at the end that says pull up. That's that internal pull-up resistor that we normally wire on our switches. It's going to put that in there for us. Okay, so we don't need to put pull-up resistors on the switches. We can either connect the switch to ground, and it'll be a zero, or disconnect from ground, and it'll get pulled up to a one. So hooking switches up to this thing is a whole lot easier. So let's see. Somewhere over here. There is a configuration file. So this file is provided for you. And it basically lists all the things that you might want to get into and out of from the board. So eight LEDs on the top, four switches, and then a bunch of I.O. locations, right? Jumper 1, locations 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. And kind of necessarily, when you start working with this kind of thing, you're going to be reading schematics. Okay, so this is another reason where, um, another reason why you kind of need to know what you're doing before you jump into Verilog. I posted a link, by the way, I sent an announcement to a link on a news story on FPGAs. I just stumbled across that yesterday, and I thought it was kind of topical. Um, because it talks about some of this stuff. So it's an open source design on the board. So this is what this board actually looks like. And you can get a five page schematic. Um, that's the FPGA right there. And this port is connected to 
Well, it's pin 30 on the FPGA. It's connected to a line called GPIO-P16. And if we go through the documentation, we can actually find a reference to that. So these, these are the holes on those connectors on the edge, right? Pin 1 is ground, 2 is power, and then all of these are I.O. ports that you can find on the schematic. And these are the actual pin numbers on the FPGA. So you've got to do a bit of, of sleuthing to link all this stuff together. But we're just going to use the LED that's on the board, and we're going to use two switches. So we don't have to worry about it too much. So let's use switch 0 and 1 and LED uh, 1. So I'm just going to copy all of this code. And I'm going to come over here and right click and say new source. And I'm going to specify a constraint file. So I'll just call this UCF for user constraint file. And the only thing I need is LED1 and our two switches. So number signs are comments, so I'm getting rid of those. So our two switches, we want those connected to A and B. And our LED, we want connected to X. All right, so now I'm going to resynthesize because it's got to figure out how to put everything onto the FPGA again now because I said I want the inputs and outputs to be specific locations, specific pins on that FPGA. So you got to resynthesize. So we'll just click the green go arrow and let it chow for a second. And let me grab the board back. Yeah. Are the following compiles quicker or does it take about it takes about the same time? it's not like Android which gets quicker after the first time um, it just takes a lot of steps all right so that wasn't too bad it's done um, so post place and route static timing completed and our arrow disappeared and no processes running we're good to go so now we're ready to make a programming file so before we do that, we want to right click on this, set process properties, and you got to come over here and say create binary configuration file. And you got to turn that on. Okay, again, all of this is spelled out on Canvas. So do that, say OK, and now just double click on here, and it'll go ahead and run something called BitGen, and this is pretty quick, it's about 15 seconds, and it'll turn its internal representation of your circuitry into a, a bit file. And we're done. We're good to go. So let's do this. And let me just kind of show you what we've gotten for all of this. So what do we call this thing? XOR gate engineering 250. So there's all the files that it's created from what we've been doing, right? <laughs> So this is why you want everything in its own directory, because this will get confusing really quickly. Um, but one of these files in particular, this bin file, that's the binary configuration file. right? And we can, we can try to take a look at that. I don't know if it will let me. And it'll be gibberish, right? So it's just stuff. But it's meaningful to the software that will, that will program this board. Okay, so I'm going to take this board and I'm going to plug it in here. I do have a port. And when you do that, it lights up. And when you take these out of the box brand new, it's running a little program with the slow Cylon eyeball just sweeping across, right? And I think the switches change the blink rate so you can make it blink faster and so on. So that's kind of cool. But we're going to blow away that program because we're going to load our own code in. Um, 
but on the software for this, you can find the Verilog code for that um, and bring it back. So let me do this. Let me switch this around. So we'll let that run. Um, so configuring the board is different depending on whether you're doing Windows or Linux. And I think both of them are described in the Canvas write-up. But let's do, we'll take a quick hop onto Canvas before we leave here, if there's time. Um, so I'm going to go under Boards, Spartan, um, version 2, and I'm just going to run a jar file. It's not going to let me do that, though. Yeah. So you'll bring up some sort of configuration tool like this. And you may have to specify the serial port. So if you're on Windows, you got to find out is it COM4, is it COM17, right? And you can do that with this mode command, which is also documented. You can just say mode, um, return, and it'll show you your serial ports. Um, so the main thing we want to do is we want to browse to this bin file that we just created. So. Um, Let's go up from here, and let's go to XOR, and let's do XORgate.bin, and open. And we're just going to say program board. And this doesn't always work, <laughs> which is fun, um, but we'll see. So it'll flash a few times while it's programming, but mostly you don't see much. But you get a progress bar here where it's programming the board. And I checked that I want it to verify after it's done programming. So after it finishes programming, it'll go back and it'll read back the program and compare it to what we wrote and make sure that they're the same. And if anything is slightly wrong, you can blow up your board <laughs> pretty easily. They're a little more durable now, but they used to smoke pretty quickly. Um, for example, if when the beginning, when you said what kind of device this was, if you thought it was a different device, you go through all of this, you get your bitstream, you load it in, you might start seeing smoke coming out of it. Okay? Hopefully not. Um, but the reason is that you're just building up hardware out of this, this blank sea of gates, right? And if you don't do it just right, it's possible to have, say, a bunch of gates with all the outputs tied together. And when you tie two outputs together and one's outputting zero and the other's outputting one, you're basically creating a short between power and ground. And so a lot of people, when they started working with these things, they would literally smoke their device, and then it's like fried. Um, it's, it's that easy. All right, so um, that did not work. Um, but imagine that it worked, right? So now you press the buttons and it gives you an XOR. Um, so I'm going to try programming it again. Yes? Do we know why it doesn't work sometimes? I have not figured that out. Like it was false flags on our experiment when we were working on Lab 8, trying to program the board. So, so for Lab 8, right, you can definitely write your code in Verilog and develop it using the Icarus Verilog system. So you can do the simulation, right, and get timing diagrams to convince yourself that the code is correct. Um, and then try to get it working on the actual hardware. So we'll do a few experiments here, see if we can figure out how to make it work. So the first experiment is just reprogram it, right, and let's see if that does it. Um, and in the past, this was pretty solid. It 
pretty much worked every single time. And the last few times I've tried this, and it might be because I'm on Linux, I don't know. But the last few times I've tried this, it's taken some fiddling to get it to work, including during the demo talk I did a couple of weeks ago. Which was, I think it's like 30 some bucks. They used to be really expensive. It was like, you know, thousands of dollars to get a, a development board. Um, and they've really come down in price. And Spartan was the first product from Xilinx that was actually really affordable. Um, and they've kept the price down, you know, 30 bucks. Well, I'm seeing part of the problem is I have a bad cable. Well, this is like a big letdown. Well, let's double check and make sure that we didn't do anything wrong, wrong. Um, nope, that's right. Let's try this. Because there was a drive specified on these inputs, and I don't think it should be there. So we'll try that. If that doesn't work, then I'll throw up my arms and say I give up for now. Um, so, so meanwhile, let's um, well, let's just wait for this. It's going to be quick. To make the programming file. And once you've gone through this, it's pretty quick to redevelop, right? So I made a change in my configuration. Click that, double click the generate programming. We've got our XOR gate dot bin. And then we're just going to say program. One thing I do know you have to do, though, is after you program it, sometimes you have to unplug it and plug it back in for the program to actually start. I don't know why. Not the program, but for the configuration to take effect. Should be good. But we are out of luck. All right. I will mess around with this and I'll post something on Canvas if I figure out like some did you plug it in and plug it out? Magic trick. Yeah, I did. <laughs> did you turn it on and off? Yeah. I'll try it again. So my suggestion at this point, right? I'm pretty sure we did everything right, but my suggestion at this point would be um, write some Verilog code just to try to turn the LEDs on, right? And let's make sure that um, that those are getting associated correctly with, with the variables in your module. So I'll go through this, and like I say, I'll post a note later on tonight and let you know what I discover. Um, but let's, let's wrap up Lab 7, um, sorry, Lab 8, and Let me talk about the traffic light. <clears throat> so the traffic light system, right, there's a totally different way that we can go about implementing this um, as a state machine. We did something kind of goofy in lab six. Not necessarily goofy, but something kind of different from the state machines we've been talking about. We used a trick 
right, where we, um, we took the old red-green traffic light system and we added a delay to the transition from, um, from green to red. But let's just think about traffic lights. And we've got west, south, east, and you've got red, green, yellow. Hopefully not in that order. How many states can this system possibly be in? What's the total number of different states for this traffic light? And it's a lot fewer than we might think, even though we've got three sensors and we've got nine lights. Six. What are six? What are the six states? Green or yellow red. Yellow red is kind of like one because it's, it's pretty much red, but just has a yellow between it. So what do you mean by green? Mean lane permission or lane not permission. But we got three lanes. Which one are we talking about? Oh, or do we need six for each? No, no, six oh. is in total. Six different states. Okay, so what are the states? West can be red or green. South can be red or green, and east can be red or green. Everybody agree with that? I don't quite agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> but there are six states, and they look very close to this. Could it be a green and yellow? Yeah, what happens if there's a yellow light? It turns red soon. Suppose that south is yellow. Which of these six states would you think we're in? So far. But what if south is red? You'd still be in SRRH. Yeah. So yeah, we need a yellow light to be able to distinguish. And the other issue with reds is, right, west and south could both be red, while east is green. So it would kind of be like we're in three states at once. But if we look at green and yellow, right, that should nail it. Because at any point, assuming we don't let all the lights be red, at any moment, exactly one of these six things is true. Either one of those lanes is yellow or one of those lanes is green. Yeah, no, I mean, you nailed it, the intuition perfectly. Um, so it's really six states. And we have three inputs, west, south, and east. And if we visualize this as a state machine, the logic is pretty straightforward. If you're in the east green state, and there's a car on the south, and there's not a car on the east, then you want to go to the east yellow state. If you're in east yellow, and there's not a car on the east, but there's a car on the south, right, or the west, you want to go to the either south green or the west green state. And if you're in south green, and a car comes to the east, you want to go to south yellow, right? And so basically, if a car with higher priority shows up, right, if you're in some green state and a car with higher priority shows up, you want to go to the corresponding yellow state. And if you're in the yellow state, you want to switch to whatever green state corresponds to the highest priority car. So each time the clock ticks and use a two second clock, look at your current state, look at the sensors, figure out what your new state is. And it's really just a bunch of if statements at that point. So it's not that bad to write it in Verilog. All right, so one more thing. I know we got like two seconds left, but let me hop onto Canvas if I have a connection. It is an if. But I know how to get it back if I need to. Hey, we're on Canvas. Um, so let me just take a look at 250. And it's this Mimas board how-to. That's the first thing you want to do if you're, if you're at the point of trying to actually configure the board. Look at this how-to, okay? This is called the Mimas board. That's, I don't know the name of it. Um, and that talks about um, setting up Xilinx, which you don't have to do because it's already set up. You don't have to install the driver. But building the project, um, 
and it shows you what you should be seeing, setting up your, your input output, right? This talks you through everything that we've done here basically this afternoon. Um, and then setting up the configuration file. So this is all simulating it in Icarus. Um, and then setting up the IO connections. So that's the configuration file and there's the input lines and so on. And then going down through um, actually running the configuration software. So on Windows, it's this thing called Mimus Config. And it also makes the note here that remember when we make switches, if the switch is open, we're not shorting it out, it's actually feeding a one. And if we push a switch, then it's feeding a zero. So for the switches, when you make the AND gate, it'll actually come out looking backwards, right? If you push both switches, it'll be feeding in two zeros, your output will be zero. So, and that's easy to do, just complement the input on the way in. All right, so that's, that's really fast and wordy, but I'll post the video and the how-to goes through everything we've done. Um, I'll be in lab tomorrow or in my office from 9 to 10 and from 11 to 12. Okay, so, so come by if you want to work on this. <laughs>